Yeah, welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance and its object-oriented implementation. And uh, I would say bad news, everyone, because the whole lecture was based on a wrong assumption. And I would like to talk a little bit about this today. So we will talk about interest rates from defaultable products, credit default intensity or default spreads. And the point is that actually we have to look at defaultable bonds. So we started looking at interest rates. So we started our considerations here by the definition of the zero Cooper bond. And it was the atomic object. So all the interest rates were derived uh, from, from this. And our assumption was that it is the guaranteed payment. So the zero Cooper bond represents the guaranteed payment of one unit currency in time capital T. And that's actually here the issue. So the issue is that this guarantee is not, not existing. Okay, so there is no such thing as a completely risk-free zero Cooper bond. So actually it may happen that you do not get your money back. Yeah, maybe it is fraud, yeah, whatever. So this uh, object is an idealization. And what we have to look at is the defaultable bond. So the issuer may default. So there's some kind of a default risk. Maybe I'm not specifying what this is. Yeah, uh, maybe um, he is going bankrupt, or there is some other issue, yeah, or even there was a, something in the contract. Uh, but there is some event that triggers that the bond does not pay back. And also um, the most part that comes now does not really rely on uh, what is the impact of the event. Is he just paying zero or is he just paying a fraction? Yeah, it's just that he's paying less. Okay, so there is um, a default event, but for the intuition, you ca sh uh, should just think of it as an event where the default uh, happens and then the bond pays zero. Yeah, So it's either one or zero. That's a good intuition, uh, but the general case, uh, there is something called recovery. We will come to this. So there is a default risk and the bond pays the one only in the case of non-default. And now I go back to where we started. So I assume that um, we can observe the market price of this contract. So the contract, including the risk of default, and this market price is here our P subscript D, yeah, D for default, with the maturity capital T observed in little t. So the default event may occur any time in between. So it may be at some point clear that the bond does not pay back. Yeah. Then of course it will also change this, this, this market price. So before that point, it's just the expectation of what could happen. And then it's maybe sure, uh, but that's um, another aspect. At the moment, I'm just assuming that we are pre-default. So we are before that point and we just observe the market price that includes the uh, expectation that this can happen. So the default event can happen anytime in between. So in between the interval from little t to capital T. <coughs> um, okay, so now I have actually two interest rates curves. Yeah? The other one is still existing, but it's maybe an idealization. I have the non-defaultable curve and the defaultable interest rate curve. So maybe I, I um, add this, yeah? So we have here, and you could say it's the discount curve because we associated zero corporate bond prices with 
discount factors. So let's call it discount curve. And we have now another interest rate curve, another curve. the default discount curve. So to be precise, actually there are many of such curves because each issuer carries its individual risk to default. Yeah? So each of these issuers, so they issue the zero copy one, so they give you the guarantee of paying back this one unit carries its individual default risk. Yeah. So maybe among your friends, yeah, there are some people that pay back yeah, with a very high probability, and some people just forgo forget yeah, about paying back. Yeah. So this risk is really different. Um, so each uh, issuer defines its unique continuum of defaultable bonds. So we should maybe distinguish between the different issuers. Yeah, there could be a government curve, which has maybe a lower risk yeah, of default, and there could be a curve related to some uh, corporate and, and so on. Uh, of course, the assumption that we can observe this continuum is uh, very strong. Yeah? So that's maybe a separate question. How can you get the data? But for the moment, just let's assume that we have this data. So we have this as an initial value to our theory. So we actually now have many different, different curves. So in the following, I just consider one such default curve. So it's the one here with the superscript D, yeah, but actually the whole theory is then for many curves. In reality, I already mentioned that all the financial products, yeah, well, there is some mechanism collateralization that somehow removes default, but all the bonds are just defaultable bonds. So, and now you can go back you know, to the first slides from interest rate theory and define all the objects again. And everything that was there, you know, I believe everything here yeah, holds. Uh, so I can now define the instantaneous forward rate based on this um, defaultable bond. I can define the discrete forward rate and so on. So I can define all these interest rates. There is a small um, issue related to our derivation. So well, that refers here to this section 38. I didn't give numbers to my section, but um, okay, so maybe you know which one I, I mean. Yeah, so the interest rate uh, section. Um, yeah, there is a small um, issue, uh, a subtle thing. In this uh, section, we somehow viewed a reinvestment strategy. So uh, we considered a reinvestment strategy, for example, in the construction of the forward rate, where we were looking at the forward bond. And now it may happen that until we reach this point, the bond has defaulted. So there is nothing left to be reinvested. So you have to be, be a little bit careful when going through this definition with this aspect. And what you could do is that you define all the objects conditional to non-default. So as long as the issuer is not defaulted, I can observe the defaultable bond price, which contains the probability of default. And I can then define from that 
these interest rates. So all of these interest rates are defined conditional to non-default. So this allows us to define these interest rates. Maybe I add this remark here to this define. Yeah. So the definition is conditional to non-default. For example, recall the instantaneous forward rate, our definition of the instantaneous forward rate. It's the yeah, slope of our observed zero Cooper bond price curve. So you, the inter interpretation is that it is a forward rate for an infinitesimal period. Yeah, it was our discrete forward rate where the period length goes to zero and period length goes to zero because you divide by the period length that is like a derivative. It's a finite difference, like a derivative. So it was the derivative of the zero copper bond price curve. And actually it was the derivative of the zero copper bond price curve divided by the zero copper bond price. So it was the derivative of the logarithm. And you see that this divided by the zero copper bond price contains the conditional to non-default because then you uh, cannot divide by zero. Yeah, Or here you would take the logarithm of zero. Okay, so we can define these interest rates on um, the defaultable bond curves. And the interest rates were just a different representation of this zero copper bond curve. So we can reverse this and we get then a representation of the zero copper bond price curve in terms of the interest rates. And if you ask yourself now, okay, why did we do this step? Okay, actually the step is because we would prefer to model the interest rates. Yeah? We would prefer to model the small components out of which we compose the zero copper bond curve. So actually, you could also write down directly a model for the zero copper bond price, but from several aspects, yeah, the interpretation of correlation and also numerical stability, it's better to actually model a differential instead of modeling an integral. Yeah? So you would rather model a differential than you would like to model an integral of a quantity. So I would like to model an interest rate, a forward rate or a discretized forward rate and not uh, the zero carbon price. So that was uh, maybe one uh, motivation yeah, why we moved to an alternative object representing our zero copper bond price curve. So now I can compare this defaultable um, quantity with the non-defaultable quantity. And sometimes uh, in yeah, industry, in mathematical finance and finance, the difference of two quantities is called a spread. And so a spread is something you have to put on top of something to reach something else. So something, sometimes the, this is called the credit spread because it is linked to the credibility, yeah, the credit risk of the issuer, the default risk, yeah. or also sometimes it's called the default intensity. So we define now the difference of the defaultable forward rate and the non-defaultable forward rate. Here is our default intensity. And in this uh, definition, it is it depends on the maturity, of course, the capital T, and it also depends on the time of observation. So it's just um, 
if the two quantities are stochastic processes or if just one quantity uh, is a stochastic process, it's a stochastic process that is the difference of the defaultable and the non-defaultable rate. So actually we will see later that this guy uh, should be positive. Yeah, so this interest rate is higher than that one. Uh, so why? Yeah, because um, <clears throat> I would request from somebody who is defaultable, I would request a higher interest rate to compensate for the event where he is not paying back. So this thing is then called the credit spread or I sometimes call it the default intensity. So now I can go back to the definition. So this definition here, so the definition holds here with the D superscript and it also holds without the D superscript. So for the defaultable and non-defaultable guy. So if I integrate this here and take the exponential, I just get the relation that the defaultable bond can be expressed as the non-defaultable zero copper bond multiplied with an ex additional factor. So I have here this exponential minus integral lambda of t and tau d tau. So I integrate over the time to maturity. So we are integrating here over the time interval where default may happen. And if you now divide by the non-defaultable bond, you see that I have that this additional factor is just the ratio of the defaultable bond and the non-defaultable bond. Okay, so now it's natural to assume that this object here is between zero and one. So um, my zero copper bond prices, also the defaultable, are all larger or equal zero because there is no obligation that we have to pay something and we get something. So there is a payment either guaranteed or in the event of non-default. And then we have the effect that this guy pays always and this guy pays sometimes. You know? So, but whenever that guy pays, this guy pays too. So I would expect that the value of the defaultable zero proper bond is less than the value of the non-defaultable zero proper bond, yeah? because this, it's just some events where I get less. Okay, maybe these events have probability zero, then it is that the default event actually doesn't happen. Yeah? Then the, I would expect that the defaultable zero proper bond has the same value. So we see that this here is by a no arbitrage argument, you could say between zero and one. And this allows me to interpret this object here, which is now between zero and one as a probability. Okay, so this is just an interpretation. It's interpreting this ratio of the defaultable, the defaultable and the non-defaultable bond as a probability. So we have an intuitive interpretation for this. We may interpret it as the, and now it's important, it's the market implied probability of survival. So um, that we survive the interval uh, or, or within the interval from little t to capital T that we survive in the sense that there is no default event. <clears throat> okay, so why is that? 
So let's uh, consider now this as a valuation problem. We would like to value the defaultable bond. And now I choose my non-defaultable bond here as numerea. So I go to my equivalent martingale measure and I choose this guy as a numerea. So then under that measure, the ratio that we are looking at, so that guy is just the expectation of the defaultable payment. So my defaultable bond P superscript D observed at maturity divided by my numerea. And now let's take the interpretation that this here is an indicator function. So I know that my numerea is equal to one and I assume now that this here is an indicator function. So I either get one or I get zero, just depending on the event of default. So let tau denote the time of the event of default. Okay, then I just have the question, did the event happen before the bond matures? So did the event happen in the interval from little t to capital T? If the default time is larger than capital T, then I will receive back one unit. Otherwise I will receive back zero. So my definition is here that I receive one in case of non-default and zero in case of default. Okay, that's actually now an interpretation. Yeah, I mean, the default event could be something else, but let's interpret it as this binary event of getting, getting nothing. Now then you see that I'm just calculating the expectation of an indicator function and the expectation of an indicator function is the probability that the event happens. So the probability that I did not default before T, you know, so the probability that tau is larger than capital T that I survive over capital T, assuming that default didn't uh, happen before. So otherwise the equation would be also correct. Yeah, it would be here a zero and here a zero because we already defaulted. Okay, so conditional to non-default, I can interpret now this ratio as um, um, a probability. And another aspect is that it is the market implied probability of survival, because I observe this object as a market price and it's not 100% clear how this market price is now being created. Yeah, There could be other effects uh, that change the price, but I'm putting everything. So all the difference to the non-defaultable bond is now put into this interpretation that it is the um, default probability. And also the market just has an expectation uh, of what happening, of what is happening in the future. So if all the market participants have actually the wrong estimate for the true probability of default, they are putting this wrong estimate into the price. And what you observe is the wrong estimate of this probability. So that's important if you now derive such a probability from a market price, you are actually deriving the average probability expectation of the market participants that has nothing to do with the probability 
the true probability. Yeah? So they could be all idiots, yeah? and then you just have the probability that assumed by these idiots. Uh, the nice thing is that if you perform risk neutral hedging, you are reducing your probability by buying financial products from these market participants. And if they are all idiots, that is okay. Yeah, so you can reduce your risk by moving it to them, by trading in their probability measure. This is the same remark that holds here for our risk neutral measure. So our risk neutral measure is also the market implied uh, equivalent martingale measure, the measure that makes the market prices to mark martingales. So we can work with this probability, but there is the link that we have to perform some kind of hedging of the default risk. So we have to trade maybe in the defaultable object to actually make use of this probability. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful when distinguishing the probability measure Q and P. Yeah? Q always relies on the fact that we perform the replication. And that's maybe also a nice um, remark which could link back to our session on the DICE model, on the climate model, where interest rate enter. Uh, you, you should maybe check, uh, is, it, is it the Q interest rate or is it the P interest rate model that should enter there? That's, uh, that's uh, a nice question. Okay, so we have this interpretation of a probability. So this ratio is the probability, the survival probability under our terminal measure. And it's not directly obvious, but the probability is monotonely decreasing in the capital T. So um, you, you, can, you, you can check this here on, on the slides. And if we are in time zero, you know, I just assume that we are under non-default. So I will drop also the measure and I will, uh, the, the numeraire, and I will just write here the survival probability. And this is just the ratio of the current zero copper bond price is defaultable divided by non-defaultable. So if this object here is the survival probability, then one minus survival is the default probability. So the probability that we will default in this um, interval. And because if you think of probabilities, then you see that this object here looks like an exponential distribution. So the lambda is just the intensity of an exponential distribution and hence the name default intensity. But everything depends on the observation point. So it depends here on the little t. So it could be a stochastic process of default intensities. So the market could change its expectation of how likely it is that default happens. So I'm integrating here lambda with respect to dt. So if you think of um, physical units, the unit is like for an interest rates, it's one divided by time. And yeah, you also see it is like an interest rate. It is like a forward rate. You have the ratio of zero copper bonds equals exponential integral, yeah, the rate times the time. Okay, and again, the remark, it's not a real probability. Yeah, it's the probability under the valuation measure and we should hedge the default risk by trading in the defaultable bonds. Uh, 
to actually make, make use of this probability. Okay, so that was just a little introduction. So now we have two different interest rate curves. Actually, we have many, the defaultable one and the issuer curves. And you can derive all the interest rates from that. And we have a nice interpretation for the ratio. It, the ratio can be interpreted as um, a probability. So we have already our interest rate model. For example, our discrete forward rate model, you know, aka the uh, LIBOR market model. And how would we now model the, the defaultable rates? So you can actually create a really big model where you go back and you model here the stochastic process of the default intensity. That's no, not so difficult. Yeah, it's then a defaultable LIBOR market model or a defaultable discrete forward rate model. But there's also an easy way to immediately integrate this secondary curve or actually also many curves into your given model of the risk neutral interest rates. And the idea is that you just assume that the spread that comes on top of your risk neutral curve. So here you have your risk neutral curve. And then on top, there is, is, is some interest rate that is a little bit higher, okay? And the spread between these two curves is our lambda, okay? The lambda is the difference between the two curves. And the idea is now that you just assume that this lambda is deterministic. If you make this assumption, in yeah, a, a, um, a good way, then it's really trivial to in, introduce this difference into your model. You have to check a few things. Uh, for example, is the derivation of your drift still correct and all this stuff? Um, but uh, yeah, that's easy to check. And then we have a model that models the issuer curve. So there is just a simplification the spread, yeah, so actually the default probability or the survival probability intensity um, is a deterministic function. So it's not stochastic. So you just have one uh, stochastic driver for the base curve for the non-defaultable part. Okay, so let's try this. So it is possible that our lambda is stochastic process, yeah, because the credibility of the issuer is uncertain and it's varying over time. But if we make the simplifying assumption that the intensity is deterministic, then it's straightforward to endow all models that we have to discuss so far with the ability to represent this additional curve. So I assume a general non-defaultable valuation model with a given numerea. So the numerea is a non-defaultable um, object. Yeah. So for example, our trading strategy in the non-defaultable bonds. And we have also our equivalent martingale measure, the Q, and we have our, oops, <laughs> so we have our equivalent martingale measure, the Q, and we have our universal pricing theorem that the value is given here by taking this expectation. So that means when I have here a non-defaultable payoff, so there is some V of capital T, then I can just value this by dividing it with the numerea and taking the expectation and multiplying with the numerea at evaluation time. So this here is some non-defaultable payoff, at least at this time. Okay, if you now have a defaultable payoff, 
then you can re just represent it by adding the multiplicative factor. And you know that the defaultable bond is the non-defaultable bond multiplied with our exponential integrate our default intensity. So I just multiply with this additional factor. Yeah? So you can move this factor from the outside to the inside, of course, of this expectation. And you see that there is an alternative interpretation. If you now have a defaultable payoff paid in capital T, <coughs> it is that you get this defaultable payoff with a certain probability. Okay, and then you value this. So this is the expected amount that you get. So then you value this as non-defaultable amount. Okay, you, you can make this a bit more formal. So actually you introduce the product space and the product measure. So I have now my measure Q for the non-defaultable part. And then I have my probability, my survival probability. Uh, so I have my measure say, P or one minus P, no? default or non-default. Um, so I'm I could introduce the product space, but what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm taking already the expectation with respect to the default event, and taking this expectation is exactly multiplying the defaultable amount with the probability of survival. So this is the expected amount. So we are integrating out the default probability. And then I can evaluate that this as a non-defaultable amount. So it's equivalent to receive this smaller amount VD, V superscript D times survival probability, it's equivalent to receive the smaller amount guaranteed compared to receiving the original amount not guaranteed. So essentially we split the probability space into the non-defaultable part where we have our measure Q and the default part where we have here our survival probability. And if the default model is a bit more complicated, so if, for example, this guy here is not deterministic, it's stochastic, and if it has a correlation, for example, to the uh, events in the non-defaultable space, yeah, then you would have to introduce a richer structure, actually a richer probability space and so on. But here I have the simplifying assumption that my intensity is a deterministic function. Yeah, So ev everything, and this is independent then of what is happening in the non-defaultable space. And then I can use this very simple representation, this very simple product space. Okay, so you see that I can immediately value um, a defaultable cash flow by just adding inside this additional factor here. So you should decide maybe in your valuation code if the cash flow is defaultable or non-defaultable and just multiply with the survival probability and then you just move on. So a little bit, it is that you have 
uh, the possible movements of your non-defaultable valuation measure. So this here is now my Q. And then I just add to every node, I just add um, a small default, small default event. Huh? And I just take always the small expectation. And here the probabilities are just P and one minus P. Yeah? They are always um, the same. Yeah? So I just take the small expectation and reduce everything to the blue tree. So this, this is the probability P and one minus P. So with probability P, I default with one minus P, I go on, for example, like that. So um, there are a few nice implications if my default intensity is now deterministic. Uh, and the first thing, is a funny thing. The lambda does not depend on the little t. Though that's nice. So if I have a non stochastic default intensity, then lambda does not depend on little t. So if we go back, I can actually drop here the little t. And you see that we have an exponential distribution with a given intensity that def defines the probability of default for the future interval. Okay, so by non-stochastic default intensity, um, actually I mean that the stochastic process of the ratio of the zero copper bonds has no diffusion term. Yeah? So if I view it as an ETO process, it does not have a DW. So this means if you take the differential of the ratio of the defaultable bond and the non-defaultable bond, so I take the differential of my survival probability factor then if I now would apply Ito's lemma, if it would be a stochastic process, then it's just the differential of this lambda dt and no dw. Actually, this, this condition is a bit, bit weaker that I do not have a diffusion here. It's uh, locally, locally risk-free, you could say. So why is that? So our assumption is that the stochastic process has uh, zero volatility. So if we now consider the stochastic process under our T terminal measure, then I know that this guy is a martingale. Yeah? So if this here is my numeraire and this is a traded asset, then this guy is a martingale. So that means the whole drift term is zero. So I have that the differential of the exponential, so the differential of this survival probability with respect to little t is zero. Well, if you differentiate this, uh, you get here um, another exponential, and then I get the inner derivative. So I differentiate here with respect to the lower bound. So differentiating with respect to the lower bound gives me lambda tt. Yeah, so plug in for the tau, the little t. So I have lambda tt. It's the lower bound. I get a minus. So the minus is vanishing, I have lambda tt, and differentiate with respect to the inner argument. So I get again, minus the integral and the inner argument. So I get that. Yeah, 
this is zero. So there's an exponential in front. I just remove that. And I have that lambda tt minus the integral d by dt lambda is zero. So I have that the lambda tt is equal to this integral. And this is true for all maturities. Uh, so this is true for all maturities. So the observation is that there is here the maturity parameter. And this is true for all maturities. So I can differentiate with respect to the capital T. Or you could also say the left-hand side does not depend on capital T. The right-hand side is then independent. It's a constant as a function of capital T. But if you differentiate with respect to the capital T, you find that this is zero. So I find that d by dt lambda of little t and capital T is zero for all maturities. So the lambda does not depend on little t. Okay, so that's that's nice. So I have a single intensity function, the lambda um, of capital T. So maybe I go back to the interpretation we had uh, on top. That one. Um, at this point, I assumed here that I can represent this as an indicator function. And then I could give you the intuitive interpretation that there is a singular default event in this time. And then I either get one or zero. But actually for all the derivation, it was not really necessary that we have this indicator function and that we have this singular event. It was just a discussion that this is a nice interpretation to interpret this object here as a probability. But in order to interpret as a probability, it's enough to know that it is between zero and one. So now uh, a small additional remark on that. Um, we had this interpretation that we interpret this as an indicator function, but with the exception of that, um, so we did not make many assumptions on the nature of the credit event itself. Uh, so what is, what is happening? And in practice, in reality, the credit event is far more complicated. So often you get back not one, but you get back a fraction. Uh, and sometimes the process that this decision is made yeah, is more complicated. So it's not 100% clear when you get back this fraction and so on. So if you just get back a fraction, this is called the recovery rate. So there are recovery rates. So it means that in case of default, yeah, so maybe I should have added this here. So this is in case of default. We get back a number R. And of course, R is now between zero and one. So we just get back a fraction. And you can make all the considerations uh, above. Now also with this recovery rate. Uh, in many financial products, it's not important um, what the recovery rate is and um, how this interpretation is. Because if you just value a defaultable cash flow, you are just multiplying with this survival probability that contains the information. What is the expected amount, amount you receive? So in that case, you actually do not need to model this aspect. But if you have a financial product that somehow depends on the default event and um, what is paid, then it may be relevant. You know, for example, 
in case of default, you get twice as much as the uh, recovery rate or something like that, then it's important to also uh, model, mo model this. So again, if we do not model this recovery and just assume that we get back zero, then we put all the information that there is some residual payment into the probability. Yeah? So um, getting some recovery with a certain probability in case of default then corresponds to getting zero with another probability that is smaller uh, to just balance the difference. So once again, the, the point that this intensity, our market implied survival probability could also be just a synthetic object in view of this, that we put also the expectation of this recovery inside this, this lambda. So you have to be a little bit careful when your financial product relies on the quantity that is paid back in case of default, then you maybe have to consider that you model a certain recovery and you will get for that recovery a different survival probability. I, I, I have a few slides uh, on, on how you can convert this, yeah, but actually the calculation is fairly trivial. Yeah, I mean, the thing that you have to uh, compare is you get one with probability, say, one minus p, or zero with probability p. Yeah? And this should then correspond to getting one with probability one minus q, or r with probability q. Huh? So the q is the probability of default. So this is the probability of default. And now in the two different models, one with recovery, one without recovery, you see that you can solve this equation for a given p, you can calculate the q, you can solve this equation and get the corresponding probabilities. Okay, so co to conclude, uh, let's talk about the implementation. And this is funny because we already did this. We did it in a different context, but we already did this. And it's very nice and very easy yeah, uh, to add this to an existing model. So I now assume that I have two different interest rate curve the non-defaultable zero copper bond curve and the defaultable zero copper bond curve. I can <coughs> define the credit spread curve. So here it is denoted with an S. It's the ratio of the two bonds taking the logarithm divided by the um, capital T. Or you can also define the forward credit spread, you, know, you can now define like the interest rates, you can also define the spreads. And uh, once you have that, we have the nice little thing that we can modify a defaultable cash flow received in capital T2 by just multiplying that cash flow. So with the survival probability. So if we receive that cash flow in T2, we would like to evaluate in T1, then we have to multiply with the probability that we survive. So the expectation of receiving that cash flow that we survive the interval from T1 to T2. So I just modify now my valuation algorithm by taking any defaultable cash flow here and by taking any defaultable cash flow and adjusting it with this probability 
of having a default between my valuation time and my payment time. Okay, payment time is the time that is associated by the number there. So, and we already had this, you can just interpret it. So if you have a fixed valuation time, so assume that we have a fixed valuation time. Then you see that my adjustment factor just depends on the payment time and that payment time is encoded in the numerator. So you see that I can interpret this as actually an adjustment of the numerator. It's a different numerator. It is the numerator of the defaultable cash flow of the defaultable interest rate curve. So I just replace my non-defaultable numerator with the numerator that is adjusted. And what is the adjustment factor? The adjustment factor is the inverse of the survival probability. So it is the defaultable bond. So it is the non-defaultable bond divided by the defaultable bond. And we had this trick before. In the context when I explained that we have a nice trick to remove the error in the bond price curve. So maybe you remember here this session. So actually the session where we were looking at here the error of valuing a zero copper bond in our numerical model yeah, under terminal measure or under spot measure. So you see there is a certain error here. And there was the nice little trick that since we know the analytic value of the zero cover bond, I can take the numerical value. So that was the numerical value and remove it. So the adjustment is then multiply with the numerical zero cover bond price and divide by the analytic one. So it's the other way around because the numerator is inside the expectation one divided by numerator. So it's actually dividing by the zero copper bond with the numerical error and multiplying with the analytic one. So I'm just removing the error. And in this section, I already had the remark that we can use this trick to model for uh, model a different discount curve. So there was already this remark here in the script that we can use this trick to adjust for a different discount curve, default intensity or a funding spread. Yeah. So funding because an issuer that has uh, a higher probability of default has to pay something in addition if he would like to get funding. And if you look in the code, there was this uh, little adjustment. Yeah? So you can go here into our little library and go to the interest rate models. And there, for example, in our forward rate model, library market model, in the function get numerair, you just find here this small adjustment and now you also see that there is the comment that it is an adjustment for a funding curve for a defaultable curve. Yeah? So that's the reason why there is here the word defaultable in the code, because there is the other interpretation that I interpret this as a defaultable bond price curve. Okay, yeah. so you see that you can easily modify the valuation model to now value defaultable cash flows by just modifying the numerator. The, the numerator of the non-defaultable model is replaced by a new numerator, which is the non-defaultable one multiplied with the non-defaultable zero cover bond divided by the defaultable zero cover bond. So if the numerator appears with one divided by in the expectation, 
I'm just dividing by the non-defaultable bond and multiplying with the defaultable bond. So all the bond price will be correct, of course, but you also see that all the um, defaultable cash flows just get their survival probability. The question is, is this harmful to the model? Uh, so we checked it numerically that the forward rates stay correct yeah if you just interpret them correctly and it's not harmful because if you now derive the drift it's just a multiplicative factor so if you derive the drift by making this traded asset divided by the numerator is a martingale so has drift zero then this condition of having drift zero is not changed if i multiply with a deterministic factor so all the derivations that we made are still the same. Of course, there are some things that are not the same because if you now value, for example, a defaultable swap option you know, or an option on a defaultable swap, then the default intensity factor is inside the option payoff. It's maximum of the value of the swap and zero. So inside this maximum of the value of the swap, there is now some scaling factor. So this will change the volatility. You know, the defaultable swap has maybe a different volatility than the non-defaultable swap, and that could change the option price. But if you value this with your numerical model, just multiply with this factor, with the probability, and you are correct. Yeah, and now I can conclude with a nice um, other interpretation. If you look at what is happening here, this looks really a little bit like an exchange rate as we had it in the cross-currency model. So we already had a hybrid model, the cross-currency model, where we modeled two different curves, Euro and US dollar, and then a currency exchange rate. And this looks a little bit like an exchange rate. Yeah? We are converting the non-defaultable Euro into the defaultable euro. So the modification in this equation looks a little bit similar to an exchange rate. So what we are doing is that we take the defaultable cash flow and we interpret it as non-defaultable. So we just put it there, the conversion factor is one, and then we discount in the non-defaultable, with respect to the non-defaultable numeraire, and we convert it back to the defaultable cash flow by applying our conversion rate, and our conversion rate is the survival probability. So we convert it back to a defaultable quantity by applying this conversion rate. So while this interpretation with the conversion rate looks nice, um, it has an issue. The conversion rate depends on the maturity. Okay, so you see there's here the maturity and the way it is written here, I use conversion rate one uh, I use conversion rate one at the future time, and then I'm discounting as non-defaultable, and then I use conversion rate survival probability at valuation time. Uh, so this doesn't fit all, yeah? So this does not yet fit very well. But maybe we are on the right track because this looks like an FX forward, yeah? This looks like a forward fx rate in a cross currency model the only thing that is missing is here the fx and why is the fx missing the fx is maybe missing because it is just one and this is now a very nice interpretation so the interpretation with the exchange rate is maybe not already there but a better interpretation is that we, we directly view this as 
a cross currency model. So as a model with two currencies. So I have one Euro that is non-defaultable and I have one Euro that is defaultable. And these two currencies, they have a currency exchange rate, which is one conditional to non-default because conditional to non-default, the exchange rate is one, but they have different interest rates. And the different interest rates curve are the curve of the non-defaultable zero copper bond and the defaultable zero copper bond. So you will get different forward exchange rates. Like in your cross currency model, if you like to exchange something in the future time, it is the current exchange rate. The current exchange rate with respect to non-default is just one because it's just the one euro. But then you also evolve with different interest rates. So um, this is really um, a nice interpretation and uh, it's, it's really also holding. Yeah? I mean, you can go back to the equations and see that you can just start with a cross currency model and just have this special assumption. You have two interest rate curves and the exchange rate is one. And then you see that you can build up a model with a stochastic defaultable interest rate curve by just taking the view of this, uh, these two currencies. So we already had such a model. We already had a hybrid model with um, a stochastic non-defaultable curve and uh, a stochastic defaultable curve when we were looking at our small two currency uh, model. Okay, so, and if you now go back to the starting point where I mentioned that we have many different issuer curves, you see that this will immediately create a model with 10 or 20 currencies if you would like to model different defaultable curves for different sectors or uh, whatever. Well, and let me then conclude. Okay, that is in my last slide. So let me now conclude with one little remark. We had a session on the DICE model, the climate model that was integrating climate and economy. And you saw that interest rate played um, a big role there. And you also saw that smaller interest rates will make the whole climate crisis more expensive yeah? because higher interest rates somehow make the future less important. There was the nice little picture that the social cost of carbon is increasing if the interest rates are decreasing. And with respect to the non-defaultable interest rate, so this year is the non-defaultable interest rate and the defaultable interest rate, so this year is the defaultable interest rate, you see our lambda is positive, R plus lambda. The default will generate a higher interest rate. So what is now the right interest rate to use in this climate model? It should be a non-defaultable interest rate because there is no option to default on the payment. I mean, you cannot say that, okay, let's, let's try it and maybe it doesn't work out. Huh? That, that's maybe not an option. There's also something like this in, 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 in balance sheets of companies. Yeah? They should always have the assumption of going concern. They should always assume that they are going on and maybe you should not factor in your own default. Uh, funny thing is that there are some models and also in the climate uh, model discussion, some are assuming the default of the human race so that the human race will distinct in the future uh, as an argument uh, to not prepare for the future. Uh, that's a strange argument. Um, okay, so if you take the view that default is not an option, you should take the non-defaultable interest rate. So you should take the lower of the two that we see here. And then comes the big question, 
are the interest rates that we are seeing on the market, are they already the non-defaultable rates or do they still contain some residual default and the true interest rate is even lower than what we see? So the question, what is the right interest rate is really an, an, an interesting and open question in this, uh, in this setup. Huh? And there is this nice little link with our lecture. That was it. Thank you.